First of all, my Lords, I'd like to support Amendment 75, which has been moved so powerfully by the noble Lord, Lord Brown of Ladyton, and supported by my noble and gallant friend, Lord Stirrup. I was struck while they were speaking uh, by one paragraph in the Joint Committee of Human Rights report, which I referred to briefly in our proceedings on Monday. In paragraph 119 on page 33 we refer to Afghanistan. It was in this context. We have observed, however, that other nations may be influenced by the way in which the UK treats its international law obligations. For example, we note that the Prime Minister of Pakistan has already referred to the UK's Rwanda policy in defence of his country's decision to expel from Pakistan hundreds of thousands of Afghans who have fled from the Taliban regime. My Lords, the committee, in reflecting on that, said at paragraph 120, the UK has a reputation for respect for human rights and the rule of law, of which we should be proud. Legislation that seeks to disapply or fails to respect international law risks damaging that reputation and encouraging other states who are less respectful of the international legal order. So here we have this sort of double paradox. Firstly, we are being cited by a government like that of Pakistan as a justification for expelling Hazara, who will face persecution as a minority in Afghanistan when they return there, who will send back women who will be treated appallingly by the Taliban, denied all their basic rights, particularly education, and in the instance of people who have served the Crown, who worked with the British forces in Afghanistan, some of whom, by the way, fall into those other categories as well. They include women, and they include Hazara. And I know that the noble Lord, Lord Sharp, who will be replying to this debate, does take a real interest in this. I've raised specific cases with him, and he's always been diligent in replying, and I'm grateful to him for that. And there are, there are people who served with our armed forces now in Edinburgh. I heard from one of them only last week, who, thanks to the noble Lord, Lord Sharp, was able to come to this country. But I also know that the Noble Lord, the Minister, cares deeply about the debt that we owe to people who have served this country, because my noble and gallant friend, Lord Craig of Radley, moved amendments, which I supported, about the position of ex-servicemen in Hong Kong who had not been covered by the BNO scheme, and who, thanks to the Noble Lord, Lord Sharp, were ultimately included, and we now know that some of those will be able to take up their rights of being able to settle here. If anyone was going to be in the target sites of the Chinese Communist Party, it would be people who served the crown. And similarly, people who served in Afghanistan alongside our forces will be in the target sites of the Taliban. So we do have a debt of honor to them. And if anyone can do anything about it, I'm sure it will be the noble Lord, Lord Sharp. And I look forward to hearing what he has to say when he comes to reply. But my Lords, I wanted really to intervene in this debate to support my noble and learned friend, Lady Butler Sloss, to support the noble Lord, Lord Scriven, the noble Baroness, Lady Hamwy, uh, the noble Baroness, Baroness Brinton, and the noble Lord, Lord Deben, in his powerful remarks about the position of people who have been trafficked. I support the amendments in this group and do so because they counter the attempt at legal fiction written right into this bill that we can confidently state that the destination of those we intend to deport is a safe place. Specifically, as the noble Lord, Lord Scriven said in relation to victims of modern slavery when he moved this group, he referred, as the noble Lord, Lord Deben did, to the 2015 legislation, which I supported in your Lordship's house and as the noble Lord Deben said, right across the spectrum, both sides, all sides of this house supported uh, the Right Honourable uh, Theresa May when she introduced that legislation as Home Secretary in another place. And I joined forces with the noble Lord Lord Coker and others in trying to defend that legislation when it's been under attack, not just now, but in previous instances as well. We need to uphold that legislation. It is landmark legislation. It's regarded in many other parts of the world as what they should be doing too. These amendments therefore seek to provide some degree of compatibility with our obligations under the Human Rights Act, international law, and under the 2015 Act. Uh, the aim, of course, of this bill is to break, the government say this to us repeatedly, to break the model of trafficking gangs. But of course, paradox 
Paradoxically, again, as things stand, this takes away the rights of the very people who are the victims of those, <laughs> those gangs. Uh, so we need to deal with that. And I'd gently say to the noble Lord, Lord Horam, whom I've known in various capacities uh, over the years that we've overlapped, to really think carefully about these groups. If we can't help them specifically, and we will come, as Lord, Lady Hamwe has told us, to children who are vulnerable next week, some of whom have had terrible stories have been told. They told their stories to the Joint Committee on Human Rights. Truly shocking to hear the things that had already happened to them. And the thought that we might put people in that position and send them to Rwanda would be extraordinary. Anyone who's traveled to Rwanda, and I have, and in neighboring countries knows how volatile the region can be and how circumstances can change very dramatically. Look at the disastrous and calamitous upheaval in Sudan, for instance, where there are now nine million people who are displaced, and within the last month alone, a further half a million who have been displaced in Darfur and sent to Chad. These are in the same region, my lord, or the endless violence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The BBC reported just last month that Burundi, Rwanda's direct neighbour, has closed its borders with Rwanda after accusing its neighbour of funding rebel attacks. Last December, Red Tabara, a Burundian rebel group, killed 20 people near the border with the DRC. I've often said, my lords, and I, you know, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but there are 110 million people displaced in the world today. From the crossbenches, we had a, a full debate on this question three years ago, urging the House, the government, the international community to tackle the root causes. Because until we tackle the root causes, everything from persecution and conflict to climate change, but the reasons why people are displaced, then people will carry on coming in one way or another. And so it's a an illusion, I think, a fiction to pretend that this bill is going to put any of that right. The effect of Amendments 23 and 27, Rwanda would not be treated as a safe country if the person is a victim of modern slavery or human trafficking. That is not a lot to ask. It creates additional criteria to take into account that a person is a victim of modern slavery or human trafficking when making a decision based on individual circumstances. And then Amendments 70, 73 and 85 prevent the removal of victims of modern slavery to Rwanda until they have a conclusive grounds decision. So that's, again, wholly reasonable. It requires the government to commission an independent report, something that my noble and learned friend, uh, Lord Anderson of Ipswich, has been so insistent about. We do need to have an independent view of these things. He and the noble and learned Lord, Lord Carlisle, bury you are a very good example of how you can have one step removed from government an independent assessment of things like our terrorism laws. Why can't we do it with this too, my lords? We should ensure the Act cannot come into effect until the aforementioned independent report has been laid before Parliament and additional criteria points that the noble and Lord, learned Lord, Lord Hope of Craighead made to your lordships on Monday. The rationale then, to sum up, for supporting these amendments is the UK has international obligations to victims which don't appear to be compatible with the proposals in the bill and the treaty. There is uncertainty about the identification of victims under the Illegal Migration Act 2023 which flow into this bill and the Home Office has not adequately demonstrated that Rwanda is able to provide the necessary support for victims of modern slavery despite the treaty obligations. And so for all those reasons, I personally support these amendments. I hope that the government will give them proper consideration and certainly make exceptions in the cases of these ex-servicemen and people who have been shown to have been trafficked.